Dr. Quay, let's start with this type of risky gain of function research that was happening at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, often with United States funding uh, from various agencies, including the NIH. What did this research involve and why is it so dangerous? Well, you're taking a virus that's already a pathogen uh, and you're adding things to it. You're juicing it up in the laboratory to either make it more transmissible, more infective, or more lethal. Um, and all three of those are dangerous if someone gets infected, walks out of the laboratory asymptomatically, and goes into the subway system, for example. Uh, that was one of the things one of your earliest papers looked at, was the connection between the subway system and the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, and the, some of the major hospitals and also the wet market. Well, that's right, Sherry. There's a, what I call it the line two conduit. Uh, I like statistics, so I'll throw it around a lot. One in 70,000 chance um, that the virus started somewhere else than line two. But line two includes the one Institute of Virology, uh, the, Hun uh, the uh, Hunan uh, seafood market, and then the high-speed rail station throughout China and the airport. So you can literally go from the one Institute of Virology downstairs into line two and come out in Sydney or London or New York or Houston without ever going outside again. Now, Dr. Quay, as I mentioned, you wrote this terrific piece uh, this week in the Wall Street Journal. We republished it here in The Australian uh, with, with Dr. Muller, who I've, uh, Professor Muller, who I've also interviewed uh, like you for, for my book at length. What is it about SARS-CoV-2, the virus behind COVID-19, that makes you think it may have been the result of experimentation, perhaps gain-of-function research in a lab? Yeah, well, so in, in our in our editorial, we talked about two of the of the signatures, the fingerprints in the virus that shows it came from a lab. But but frankly, at some point, we should talk about the the very strong evidence that it's not from nature, you know, from from a lab in general. You could have a, a lab leak of a natural virus or a man-made virus. But um, there is a signature in the in the in the virus that's not present in any other virus that SARS-CoV-2 could have come from in terms of recombination. So it's, it's something that's never been seen in this virus class before. There's some detailed science arguments, and you'll hear people dispute that, but, but I, I'm happy to debate them. Uh, and the other is that it was completely pre-adapted to humans. So SARS-1 uh, emerged, both practiced going into humans without sustaining human-to-human -human transfer. This is the first virus from nature that has strong human-to-human -human transfer right from the, the beginning. And both of those are a issue of, of work in the laboratory. Just to go into a little bit more detail about, you know, th this feature that hasn't appeared in other beta coronaviruses before, it's on the furin cleavage site, at the risk of, of getting too technical, can you give a bit more detail about why this furin cleavage site is so unusual and why it is that it is this feature, this feature that makes it so infectious to humans? So, you know, furin cleavage sites, lots of viruses have them, HIV, influenza. Since 1992, laboratories have been putting them into viruses that didn't have them, uh, 11 different laboratories, 11 different experiments, including previous Wuhan Institute of Virology experiments. Every single time, 11 out of 11, it makes it more virulent, more transmissible, or more lethal. So, the beta corona class that, that this is in um, doesn't have any in its class. Remarkable finding. Uh, you know, thousands of viruses and, and not a single one with a furin cleavage site. They're in other viruses that are, that are cousins, but these cousins, they don't mate. They're not allowed to, they don't recombine together. So the furin site itself is completely unusual in this class, but then it gets worse. The, the furin site is coded for in the genetic material by letters, and they, the letters come in three-letter words that make, a, make an amino acid. So there's this two arginines in the spike protein. There are two amino acids next to each other in the spike protein, and there's two words that code for those. It's the same word repeated, CGG, CGG. Uh, and this is a language that this virus can't speak because CGG, CGG has never appeared again in any of the viruses that it can recombine with. It's, there's, like, there's one that's you know a, a, a thousand years apart ge uh, genetically, but nothing, nothing that's similar. So it's sort of a double, a double finding where it's, it's a functional site that doesn't exist and it's in a language this virus can't speak. 
Um, but it's but the language it is, it is in uh, is the one you can buy from from the biotech companies if you want to drop this thing in in the laboratory. Dr. Quay, another you know fascinating thing that's emerged as I've been speaking to many scientists around the world on this topic is that they say that it looks like SARS-CoV-2 uh, has a backbone from a bat, a virus like RATG13, which shares a 96% genetic identity to SARS-CoV-2. So it might have a bat backbone, but then they say the spike protein looks like it has come from a pangolin. This is an assessment that you don't necessarily agree with. Why is that? Well, I think I think uh, this. I, I may agree with what you just said. I, I think the question of what is the ancestor of SARS-CoV-2 and is it RATG13? I, I don't believe it is. There's 1,100 changes you have to make to get from RATG13 to, to SARS-CoV-2. Um, and unless I can do that in a couple quick descriptions in the laboratory, uh, it gets very attenuated, it gets very convoluted. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, but um, I, I think a lot of people that think either that virus or there's a couple other viruses that are even a little farther away uh, are the precursor to SARS-CoV-2. I, I think they're, it's subject to a lot of criticism because it takes so many steps to get those uh, 1,100 nucleotide changes. Dr. Quay, quickly before you go, you know, you mentioned in your in passing there that one of the options for how this virus might have leaked from a lab is that it could have been a natural virus, a naturally occurring virus that leaked from a lab. What I've just shown on air tonight is that the Wuhan Institute of Virology definitively had bats in cages in their lab. Does this suggest to you that this is a potential avenue for how a naturally occurring virus, if it was one, might have leaked? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, in, in September, in the middle of the night, they, they took a database of 16,000 uh, coronaviruses that they found in nature offline and, and, and made it unavailable to, to the, the healthcare people of the world, you know, at the beginning beginning of a pandemic. So so they had they have a lot of coronavirus work in there, both natural, and then we know they're doing gain of function. Um, they literally have the largest collection of natural coronaviruses in the world, uh, and they're one of only three labs that do gain of function research on coronaviruses. So, you know, it, it, could, it could have gotten into line two either way, um, I mean, I think there are signatures of lab gain of function work. So that's why I lean towards that. Dr. Quay, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sherry. Take care.